How's everybody doing this afternoon? I'd like to welcome everybody here to this event on the Flores exhibits. Um, we'd like to start with a brief introduction of the Flores exhibits performance and uh, the Flores agreement. And I'm um, joined now, uh, my name is Eric Mayer Garcia. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Theater, Drama and Contemporary Dance. And I'm joined by Lee Sunday Evans, um, who is a two-time Obie Award winning director and was recently appointed artistic director of Waterwell, the performing arts company that produced the uh, Flotus exhibits. Her work has been seen in the BAM Next Wave Festival, Lincoln Center, The Public, Play Heights, Play, uh, Playwrights Horizons, Steppenwolf, Arts Emerson, Sundance Theater Lab, Abarishnikov Art Center, the International Edinburgh Festival, among others. The New York Times has continually praised her directing, and she is the co-creator of the Flores exhibits. Uh, Lee, thank you for joining, uh, joining our event today. And um, a, you know, I just wanted to start with a little bit of background on the Flores agreement. Um, and so if you could maybe tell us a little bit about what that is and how that came about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Eric, thank you so much for having me today and having um, hosting this ex this event for the Flores exhibits to be part of um, the work that you're doing at IU, which is so amazing. So I will share a little bit about um, how we created the Flores exhibits project and the website, which is going to be the videos that you're going to see as the start of this um, opportunity to hear from some really incredible panelists. So. Um, the story kind of begins last summer. So about one year ago, um, in the summer of 2019, I met an immigration lawyer in New York City named Alora Mukherjee, and she is the um, director of their immigrant rights clinic at Columbia University Law School. And for many years, Alora has worked as a monitor for the Flores Settlement Agreement. And what that means is that she has um, many times throughout her career gone to visit detention facilities, immigration detention facilities that are along the US-Mexico border, and she asks young people who are under the age of 18 a standard series of questions that are meant to understand whether or not the U.S. government is in compliance with the protections that are outlined in the Flores Settlement Agreement. And those protections involve things like making sure that um, anyone who's under the age of 18 has access to safe and sanitary conditions, is held in the least restrictive environment possible, um, is uh, released to a parent or guardian in the United States without any unnecessary delay, and is not to be held in immigration detention for longer than 72 hours. So um, Alora and other people um, like Alora, lawyers, judges, some doctors who work as monitors for the Flores Settlement Agreement have been doing this for many years. Um, that settlement agreement was um, put in place in 1997 and is um, one of one of the kind of like primary legal frameworks about kind of what we think of as like human rights protections for um, legal minors who are in immigration detention at the US Mexico border. And so in June 2019, Alora was part of a team, they went as monitors. Um, uh, again, this is something that she had experienced doing before, and they went to two detention facilities in Texas. And the conditions that they saw there were so detrimental and they saw so many violations of the Flores Settlement Agreement that they decided to do something they hadn't done before um, and take those stories into the public sphere. So they felt that it was important that um, the public have access to um, understanding what was happening inside the detention facilities and what kind of conditions um, were um, being created there for young people um, who were being held in immigration detention. So when I met Alora, um, she and some of her colleagues had been um, speaking in the media about these stories and Alora had just testified in front of the House Oversight Committee and she came to Waterwell and said, is there something that Waterwell would be able to do to take these testimonies and give more people a way to access them, a war a more um, people the ability to experience these stories for themselves? And so um, we created these videos um, as a way to do exactly that, give more people the ability to experience these firsthand stories for themselves, um, to try to connect to the really first person, you know, experience of a young person who has this experience in immigration detention. So that's a little bit of context about the videos that you're going to see today. Thank you. I also noticed uh, that this is, there's a, a bigger project um, or sponsorship behind, you know, uh, the creation of these videos. 
one was the Broadway Advocacy, Advocacy Coalition. I was hoping maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and also Project Amplify. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, the Broadway Advocacy Coalition is run by an incredible group of artists in New York City, um, a few of whom are close colleagues of mine, and they have a partnership with Columbia Law School. So it's a little bit of a backstory, but um, I was directing another project with Waterwell in New York City that was about immigration, and they introduced me to Alora, and we started thinking about how we could make this project together. And so Broadway Advocacy Coalition is doing incredible work talking about kind of the intersection of art and activism and storytelling and citizenship. And so um, it was really natural fit for us to work with them on the, the creation of the project. So definitely check out their work. Um, and Project Amplify is another kind of parallel project that was started by another one of the lawyers named Warren Binford, who was part of that same group of lawyers who were working as monitors for the Flores Settlement Agreement. Um, so Project Amplify, you can go to their website and see a lot of other projects that they have done as well, um, as well as contributing some input and um, kind of some collaboration in the early phases of making the Flores Exhibits project. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and giving us some context on the videos that we're about to see. Um, so uh, I'd like to just say a little bit about the, the videos, the first videos that we'll screen here as part of the event. Um, so um, the, we're gonna show two of the exhibits. So I guess one thing to point out about the Flores exhibits is that there's, there are a series of videos, but they're, they're almost um, structured like legal exhibits, making an argument um, about uh, the, the, the abuses and the, and, and the violations against Flores. Um, and we're gonna show two back to back. Uh, we want you to know that these exhibits feature stories that deal with intense subject matter and, and we appreciate you taking the initiative to engage with these testimonies. Um, the first exhibit is uh, uh, from exhibit number 63. It's written and, and read by Alora Mukherjee um, and she's the director of the Immigrants' Rights Clinic at Columbia Law School and was uh, the collaborator for, with Waterwell for the Flores Exhibits project. The second uh, excerpt, or the second video is, is um, exhibit number 41, read by Modesto Flaco Jimenez. And uh, it is the test he reads the testimony of a 15-year-old from El Salvador who traveled to the border with uh, two brothers, ages 11, and 19. I have been representing clients who are immigrants, including those in immigration proceedings, for more than 16 years. I first represented immigrants seeking asylum as a law student in a clinical program in January 2003. My work related to Flores from January 2007 to March, 2009, to March 2019. I started investigating and working on Flores issues in January 2007. At the time, I was the Marvin M. Karpatkin Legal Fellow at the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU. From January 2007 until my ACLU fellowship ended in September 2007, I worked with a legal team to investigate conditions at the T. Don Hutto Family Detention Facility in Taylor, Texas represent children and families detained there, litigate numerous Flores violations at the facility, and settle the case. More recently, I have participated in inspections of federal immigration detention facilities and interviews with detained immigrant children pursuant to paragraph 32 of the Flores Settlement Agreement. In July 2018, I interviewed children detained at Casa Padre in Brownsville, Texas, and I participated in a tour and inspection of that facility. In March 2019, I interviewed children detained in Homestead, Florida. Following both of those site visits, I was concerned about numerous Flores violations. I conveyed my concerns to the plaintiff's legal team on the Flores case but I did not speak with any journalists about my findings. My experiences at the CBP facility in Clint, Texas in June, 2019. From June, 2000, from June 17th to June 19th, 2019, I personally met with 
and interviewed 15 children detained at the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Facility in Clint, Texas. I observed additional children who are being interviewed by my colleagues as part of our Flores inspection. The children whom I personally met with ranged in age from five months to 17 years old. These children were detained in CBP custody for days and up to nearly a month. Never before in my life have I witnessed, heard of, or smelled such degradation and inhumane treatment of children in federal immigration custody. I saw and smelled children who were dirty. I saw children who wore clothing that was visibly stained with dirt, nasal mucus, and breast milk. None of the children I interviewed reported having access to soap to wash their hands. Some had not showered or bathed since crossing the border. Nearly all were wearing the same clothing they had on when they crossed the border into the United States. All reported that they did not have access to clean clothing. Some children had not brushed their teeth at all since crossing the border. No child was offered an opportunity to brush their teeth every day. Because of the lack of access to basic hygiene, a number of the children smelled terrible. When I interview children in detention centers, I typically try to sit near them in an effort to build rapport and trust as we discuss sensitive and traumatic issues. I tried my best to sit near all the children I interviewed in Clint. Multiple children had a strong stench emanating from them because they were dirty and had not showered. Children reported being hungry. By my third day of interviewing children at Clint, I could not stand by doing nothing for hungry children any longer. I offered three children bananas and oranges. The children ate them rapidly. After I interviewed these three children, I checked in with a guard to ensure that they could each eat their lunch since each child had reported being hungry nearly each day at Clint and waking at night with hunger pangs. The guard took the children away, then returned with them very quickly. When the children entered the conference room, I asked whether they had eaten. Given how little time had passed since they left the room, I was incredulous when they each said yes. The guard confirmed. They ate, they were really hungry. Children appeared to be traumatized. They consistently cried and some wept in their interviews with me. One six-year-old boy did not seem able to verbalize responses to most of my questions. He could not even tell me his name. I learned from the guards and CBP council that this little boy did not have any family members detained with him at Clint. I spent nearly an hour with this child, first trying to interview him and then just letting him sit on my lap while I rubbed his back. He wept almost inconsolably for most of the time. At one point, I started tearing up as well. CBP counsel saw us together, and I later pleaded to have this child be appropriately cared for. In all my years representing immigrants, I have teared up in front of government counsel only once before. Eventually, a CBP officer came with a bag of lollipops and gave this child a lollipop as an incentive to bring him back to his cell. Children expressed fear of the guards at Clint. One 15-year-old girl I spoke with was too scared to have her name associated with the declaration that she wanted to share with this court. She explained that she was scared of retaliation and harm 
by the guards if they learned her identity. Then she then cried. Other children reported that despite their hunger, they were too scared to ask guards for more food. Exhibit 41. Declaration of AMOR. I AMOR declaring the penalty of perjury that the following is a true and correct to the best of my knowledge and recollection. I came from El Salvador with my brother who are 11 and 19 years old. I am 15 years old. My birthday is, we came to be with our mother who lives in the United States because of the gangs were threatening us. They came to our house and beat up our aunt and so we had to leave before they came back. They took our older brother to another facility and then brought my younger brother and me here to the Clint Border Patrol Station two days ago. At first, my brother and I were together, but then they said that he could not be in the same room. A Border Patrol agent came in our room with a two-year-old boy and asked us, who wants to take care of this little boy? Another girl says she will take care of him, but she lost interest after a few hours and so I started taking care of him yesterday. His bracelet says he is two years old. I feed the two-year-old boy, change his diaper, and played with him. He is sick. He has a cough and a runny nose and scabs on his lips. He was coughing last night, so I asked to take him to see the doctor, and they told me that the doctor will come to our room, but the doctor never came. The little boy that I am taking care of never speaks. He likes for me to hold him as much as possible. We live in room 203 with 25 children. I estimate that it is about 10 by 15. The first night I slept on the concrete ground and used a blanket to cover me because it was so cold. I could not sleep because I was so cold and my head hurt. Yesterday, some of the girls left and so I was able to get on one of the beds. Last night, the little boy and I were able to sleep in the beds together. Today, a nurse got mad at us because a comb is missing. Two girls asked to use a comb, but only one was returned. We are not allowed to keep the combs. So they came in and took out all of the beds and all of the blankets in order to punish us. Now we will have to sleep on the floor. In our room, there are two toilets and a sink. One toilet is out in the open and the other is in a store with no door, so there is no privacy when we go to the bathroom. There is no soap. We eat in the same room. Some of the children have to eat on the floor. I have to change the little boy's diaper on the bed. Since arriving here, I have never been outside and I have never taken a shower. I, A-M-O-R, swear on the penalty of perjury that the above declaration is true and complete to the best of my abilities. This declaration was read to me in Spanish, a language in which I am fluent. A-M-O-R, June 19, 2019, Exhibit 41. First, I'd like to thank the technical team and the Arts and Humanities Council at Indian University for facilitating this and making this possible. Um, we're gonna, we want to discuss the, the, um, what we've just seen um, presented, the testimony presented through the Flores exhibits. But first, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, so the panelists of scholars who are joining us this afternoon, uh, the first is Andres Guzman. He's an associate professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at Indiana University Bloomington. He is a scholar of Latin American and Latinx literature and culture. His work, his work focuses on immigration, political economy, and political and cultural theory. He is the author of Universal Citizenship, Latina O Studies at the Limits of Identity, published by the University of Texas Press. Our second panelist is Dr. Mincy Awanda Martinez Rivera. Uh, she is an assistant professor of anthropology in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Providence College. She is an anthropologist and folklorist, and her research and teaching focuses on Latin American indigenous youth culture, indigenous popular culture, expressive cultural practices, and critical indigenous and anti-oppressive research methodologies. Next year, her co-edited volume with Solimar Otero, Theorizing Folklore from the Margins, Critical and Ethical Approach and um, ethical, ethical approaches will be published by Indiana University Press, and she is currently working on her book manuscript, tentatively titled "Getting Married in Hawan: Creating Culture, Performing Community." For the last two years, she has cooperated with the Social Justice Collaborative, 
a nonprofit organization in California that provides legal aid, aid on immigration cases. Uh, also joining us is Dr. Guillermo de los Reyes. He's an associate professor of Latin American culture and director of undergraduate studies in the Department of Hispanic Studies at the University of Houston, where he also serves an associate director as associate director of women's gender and sexuality. Dr. De Los Reyes holds an MA and PhD uh, from uh, uh, the University of Pennsylvania in folklore and folk life. Dr. De Los Reyes is the author of Herencias Secretas, Masonería, Política y Sociedad in Mexico, Secret Heritage, Freemasonry, Politics and Society in Mexico, and various journal articles and book chapters on Freemasonry, Secret Societies, Gender and Sexuality and Masculinities. He is currently working on a manuscript entitled Rethinking Sexuality, Gender, Race and Class in Colonial Mexico. Uh, Vivian Nunn Aloram is a professor of English and associate dean for diversity and inclusion in the College of Arts and Sciences, Sciences at Indiana University Bloomington. She is from Puerto Rico. Her research and teaching focus on Caribbean and world literature, ethnic and immigrant literature of the Americas, food studies, and postmodernism. Her books include The Immigrant Kitchen, Food, Ethnicity, and Diaspora, published by Ohio State University Press, and Exhibiting Slavery, the Caribbean Postmodern Novel as Museum, uh, by, published by the University of Virginia Press. Thank you so much for joining us, panelists. So the first um, question that I wanted to start with uh, in, in, in discussing and unpacking what we've seen um, is, is, is what is the relationship between the torture-like conditions documented by the testimony resulting from the administration zero the, the Trump administration's zero pol tolerance policy and the larger context of militarization of the US-Mexico border or the criminalization of undocumented immigrants or asylum seekers crossing that border. So um, first, thank you, Eric, so much for organizing the event and uh, for inviting me to participate in the panel. Um, I also very much look forward to what the other panelists have to say as well. So. Uh, well, we certainly have to investigate and denounce the way uh, the current administration has escalated methods of immigration and border enforcement uh, that increase human suffering, it, often in conjunction with detention. Uh, we must also keep in mind uh, that the use of suffering and detention as an enforcement strategy uh, has characterized immigration and border enforcement for a long time, and it has similarly, similarly characterized the U.S. asylum, asylum system. So immigrant and refugee detention has dovetailed with um, mass incarceration in the US since at least the beginning of the 1980s. It, ironically, in the case of refugees, this resulted from efforts to give refugees more protections. So while the Immigration and Nationality Act allows someone seeking entry to be detained for further inquiry, uh, until 1981, this authority was rarely exercised. Such people were either paroled pending the resolution of their status um, or quickly uh, denied entry and forced to return to uh, where they came. Uh, with the Refugee Act of 1980, through which the U.S. adopted the prevailing uh, definition of a refugee in international law as someone with a credible fear of persecution uh, on the grounds of race, religion, nationality, uh, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, uh, it became more, dif more difficult to quickly remove asylum seekers. Um, people seeking asylum could now delay the removal uh, while their claim for, uh, of credible fear was evaluated. So coinciding with public concern over crime rates and an influx of poor and racialized um, refugees. So here, precisely keeping in mind that the late 1970s and early 80s saw a rise in Haitian refugees, um, the state turned towards uh, detention over parole. So detention, moreover, was used to try to deter more asylum seekers from coming. Um, so, and I won't go into this um, at the moment, I'll just mention that the decades of the 80s and 90s uh, were also defined by concerted efforts to criminalize non-citizen behavior in a way that made it much easier to detain and deport them. And here we're talking about not just undocumented people, um, people on parole or visa holders, but also talking about permanent residents. Um, yet what I want to highlight is another um, enforcement, enforcement strategy known as prevention through deterrence. So since 1994, uh, Border Patrol strategy has focused on fortifying urban zones 
uh, along the border um, in order to channel border crossers toward uh, remote areas with the objective of using the harsh desert and mountain terrain and the threat of death posed by it as a form of deterrence. Um, the Border Patrol states this directly in its own strategic plan from that year. Uh, as expected, this has caused dramatic, uh, a dramatic increase in uh, migrant deaths, which one conservative, conservative estimate uh, put at about um, 5,000 in almost 600 between uh, 1998 and 2012. And we must emphasize that these estimates are, are low, actually. Um, so these numbers have continued to increase in subsequent years. Uh, there's evidence that during um, 2019 and 2020, people have increasingly chosen uh, to enter through the desert um, after being either uh, turned away at official ports of entry or refusing to abide by the Remain in Mexico policy. Mm -hmm. um, so the Remain in Mexico policy, uh, the official and euphemistic name of which is the Migrant Protection Protocols, um, was officially announced in January 2019. Mm -hmm. It requires people applying for asylum to stay in Mexico while they wait um, their hearing. About 60,000 asylum seekers uh, have been made to wait in squalid encampments with little access to basic necessities like food, soap, water, etc. Uh, journalist John Washington writes uh, that by August 2019, not a single person who had been forced into this program had been granted asylum. Mm -hmm. Yet by October 2019, there were over 340 confirmed cases of rape, kidnapping, torture, and other violent attacks against asylum seekers returned to Mexico under the program. Um, so we can see the way in which the Remain in Mexico policy tends to combine the threat of violence with a form of captivity and containment. Uh, while the conditions at these camps already facilitated the spread of infectious disease, the pandemic has made this uh, a more dire reality. The pandemic, moreover, has brought asylum and immigration courts to a near standstill. Um, and as a consequence, asylum seekers have been made to endure these conditions for over a year and a half as they live in a state akin to indefinite detention. Uh, these torture-like conditions and the prolonged suffering they affect continuously grind away at people's mental and physical health. And they should be seen in continuity with both the longer history of um, the U.S.'s treatment of immigrants and asylum seekers, as well as with the conditions described by the floor's videos. Thank you for those comments, uh, Dr. Guzman. I, I was, you know, I'm also really, um, uh, you know, I, I think of all the, the recent news about um, the Attorney General Jeff Sessions, uh, you know, and his language of directly separating families, um, you know, the idea of this, these kinds of, as you said, the um, prevention through deterrence, that these um, policies are intentional um, and created to, um, you know, with, without any thought of the, the experience of the asylees or what they may be going through. I mean, it seems completely disconnected from the situation. Um, I think I want to um, move to the next question for the panel, uh, which is uh, thinking about the aims of this recent zero tolerance policy, or even perhaps, you know, going back to the 90s with the prevention through deterrence and things that that could have brought up. Um, but this uh, policy completely overlooks why asylum seekers are leaving their countries in the first place. Um, and the testimony read by Modesto Flaco Jimenez um, explaining how the, the, these siblings were not safe in El Salvador. Um, you know, both Guillermo de los Reyes and uh, Mincy Martinez Rivera have served as expert witnesses for asylum cases. And so I was hoping each of you, starting with Dr. de los Reyes, could share, um, you know, about your experiences as expert witnesses and um, maybe shedding our, a little light on why people are are coming to the border asking for asylum in the first place. Um, thank you, Dr. Mayra Garcia, for the invitation and for organizing this uh, very important event because we need to hear about these, you know, uh, these cases, this situation, what is what is happening. And related to your question, who are the people who are uh, who are an expert witness, such as uh, Dr. Martinez and, and myself, have been expert witnesses? Help. Who are the asylum seekers? 
And these are individuals uh, who, of course, are not U.S. citizens, who have fled persecution and fear, returning home because of their threats of future past and future persecution. Many of them have sur uh, survived extreme violence and severe human rights violations perpetrated by their families, friends, partners, law enforcement officers, gang members, and coyotes uh, when they are trying to cross uh, the border. In most of the cases, the government uh, is unable or unwilling to provide protection. And the applicants uh, must show a nexus between past or future or, or feared future persecution and, and one of the five uh, protected grounds that uh, my colleague may, uh, previously mentioned, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and membership in a particular social group. And in this case, in the membership of, uh, in a particular social group, since my, my expertise, one of my expertise is on gender and sexuality in Mexico. I, in 2012, I was asked uh, by a colleague in the immigration clinic here at the University of Houston to serve as an expert witness, to write a country conditions report. Because for asylum cases, experts are commonly uh, used to establish uh, country conditions and, and yet uh, to establish a psychological or medical condition arising from persecution. Uh, it's critical for the asylum, the asylum seeker to show the nexus between their membership in the social group and their past or fear of future persecution. That is why the lawyers who are working on the case, in the case of, for example, the immigration clinic, they work pro bono to help these individuals who have no uh, financial resources. I do most of my cases pro bono. And in the report, we need to corroborate the that the individual, in the case of, of, of my, uh, the collaborators, that uh, they are members of the LGBTQ social group, and uh, it is important uh, to be very objective, to look at all the evidence that we have, for example, in the case of, of Mexico, the, the US government uh, argues that uh, because census marriage uh, was uh, uh, approved in Mexico City, and then in some parts of later in some parts of the country that now is, is safe to be an LGBTQ, a plus individual in Mexico, and because of that, there has been a backlash. Mm -hmm. And just to just to give you an example of several of the of the testimonies, um, the, the 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 people I mean have suffered rape, violence by by members of their family, gang members, the police, either before when they are coming to to the U.S. in the border, and also I have had the the I mean. Uh, I have visited the detention centers when the, these people report that uh, they don't get medicine, they don't have proper like sanitary conditions. Uh, some of the inform some of the people have um, they are HIV positive and they don't they, they cannot see a, see a doctor or get their medication. So there is a complex situation. Is uh, inhumane um, uh, conditions uh, similar to the. Like, like what the Flores, uh, the Flores exhibit has mentioned, and many of them are, are violating the, the, Flore, the Flores agreements that, that, that you mentioned before. So in summary, um, um, I have had, um, as, as a scholar who most of my work usually is published and read by other colleagues and students, the fact that I have been able to use my expertise trying to help people who have no resources who are seeking persecution has been something very important in my life as, as a professor mm -hmm. and as a human being in general because when you see when you have a trans woman in a solitary condition in a detention center because she's a woman presentable as, as a woman and, and and they don't have the, the, the as they don't want to put them in the proper facilities when you also have trans uh, trans women, along with other uh, cis men, and also being raped at the detention centers. We have reports of that. So basically, that has been my experience, and I will talk about it later and how we can help later on today in, 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 in our discussion. 
and Dr. Uh, Martinez also has so much to share about this. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much first, uh, Dr. Mayor Garcia for the invitation and, and to be also talking about this very important and powerful yet also kind of like heart wrenching uh, topic and you know, to be in this conversation with you know, dear friends and colleagues. So thank you so much for that opportunity. Uh, so building on what Guillermo, Dr. Uh, Reyes de los Reyes was talking about uh, and the type of work that we do. So um, a little bit of background. So, uh, so I do my research in, in Mexico, specifically in Michoacán, uh, and I started doing my research in 2005. And it was in 2006 when the, when the, the war on drugs started. So even though I was not focusing on obviously the dark drug on wars as you know, youth culture and, and other stuff, but I was there. So I ended up documenting it and it's taken me a while uh, but I'm writing about it and, and what it means to do research in a conflict zone. Um, because either I like it or not, because, you know, it's home, uh, you know, Michoacán is a conflict zone. It's not necessarily that same experience in all of Mexico, uh, but definitely in some parts of Mexico, you have this conflict zone. Um, so a couple of years then uh, ago, I was actually in a, in a conference and some uh, group of friends uh, and anthropologists, they organize a panel on um on being expert witness and how to do this work and so i was very much interested so long story short um a friend that he's professor at uc berkeley uh, so he was contacted by the social justice collaborative which is this nonprofit organization that does uh pro bono work on asylum for immigration cases, but also asylum seekers. So they contacted him with a case that he couldn't do because he didn't know that he didn't have the knowledge. So he put them in contact with me. And since then I've been working with them on cases specifically focusing on country situation and specifically focusing on um, Jalisco, Michoacán, Guerrero, so Central Mexico, Central West Mexico. Uh, because as expert witness, as Dr. De Los Reyes was mentioning, right, we have our specialties. Um, so it's not, you know, I cannot be an expert witness on everything, right? So I'm an expert witness very much on this region and especially with topics that have to do with narco violence, state violence, femicides, um, uh, and also kind of like family violence. And normally, unfortunately, all of these go together. Uh, so especially with the cases that I've been working on, all of these, it's, it's uh, families or individuals um, or women that are fleeing uh, what is happening uh, in the state. Um, so, so it's been, it's been, uh, it's, it's, it's been a journey. But so, so that is a little bit in terms of um, how I kind of arrived to do this work. But in some of the situations, right, and especially tying it in with the, the videos that we already saw, is that people do not want to move. People are not looking to seek asylum. Uh, so in all the cases that I've been working on, they all say, I didn't want to leave home. I wanted to be home. I wanted to be with my family, but this happened and I needed to leave in order to save the life of my family, my life, you know, depending on their own situation. So, so sometimes the, the press and the news, the way that they want to portray this is if uh, people have options, they don't. Um, and I remember in one of the, the court that I, one of the times that I testified in court, um, the, the, um, the prosecutor, it was prosec the prosecutor, right, was like, well, why don't they move there? And I'm like, well, they can move there. They cannot move here. So they was trying to look and relocate them inside of Mexico. And I'm like, that does, that's not how it works. Uh, so obviously did not use that tone with the lawyer in the middle of court. Um, but, uh, but really explaining, right, in terms of what are dynamics that it's not that you can just relocate to somewhere else because they will find you. Um, and, and in terms of thinking about narco and, and state violence, right, the, again, the cases that I've been working on. So again, the people that are, are asking for refuge is because that is the only choice, the only option left to be able to survive. Um, so something also that, that is important to keep in mind, as well as what uh, Dr. Guzman already talked about in terms of the kind of like general situation on the detention centers, but also uh, in immigration policies and refugee policies, uh, and something that he highlighted that is very much this violence is new, and the torture conditions and this level of um, of you know the system trying to look for ways to deter people to come right to to 
immigrate, but again, it's not immigration as such, right? It's very much asylum seeking and refugees. Um, something that does, has happened though, um, is that the people that are now in the system are people that were able to get into the asylum system before the Trump administration. Um, so for example, all the cases that I've been working on are, ca are cases of people that had to flee 2011, 2013, 2014. There is a change, uh, because there was a change in policy after 2016, that there, and then after also what Dr. Guzman was talking about the, since January 2019, the staying in Mexico policy, that because they're keeping people in the borders, that means that because they're not crossing, then the, the, the court cases are not moving through. Uh, and so people are less and less people asking for asylum because the system basically has them in a bottleneck. Um, and also they keep changing the rules of what counts for granting asylum. Um, so every time that I'm working on a case, I'm with the lawyers, okay, so what is going to be the argument? Because every time it's changing. Um, so, and every time is also reducing. As, as De Los Reyes was also talking about, Dr. De Los Reyes, right? Is that it, they're making it harder to be able to grant asylum. And uh, so it's always trying to look for different ways of arguing to be able to give asylum. So one of the last times that I, I testified in court, fortunately, the, the family was granted asylum. And it was the most beautiful feeling that you can, you know, you can imagine when, you know, I got the call from the lawyer telling me that the family was granted asylum and that I was able to help. Uh, and it's people that I've never met and that I will never proudly meet. Um, but again, so the system and the way that it's been doing is this bottleneck that it's less and less people getting asylum, asylum, sorry. And, uh, and, and also the amount of people that the United States, part of the international agreements, right, to relocate refugees. So the United States at the end of Obama's presidency, even with all its issues and problems, uh, but they were, I think, accepting and relocating over 100,000 refugees. Right now, it's less than 20,000. Uh, so in terms of, you know, what is happening and, and this level basically of bottleneck and that is creating the systems to for what is happening in the border, right, with these basically torture centers. Yeah, so. Eric, I just wanted to add, for example, there is one case from, I mean, the, the, from 2012 that I'm, um, that I mean, actually the, the, the report, I mean, they, they filed the, the case in 2012. And the, the, the case is going to be here by a judge in 2021, a case from 2012. Yeah. So um, that, sorry, sorry, pardon. I was really going to say that, I mean, many of the, some of the, many of the uh, asylum seekers are in the deten uh, detention centers. Mm -hmm. And everything got pushed back. So everything, all the hearings, the same thing with some of my cases. Everything got pushed back to either 2021, 2021 or 2022. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Guillermo. Thank you, Mitzi. Thank you, uh, Andres, for, for your thoughts so far. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and show two more uh, videos and I just wanted to introduce them um, again this is this, these are very hard to hear the testimony for um, so please be aware um, so the next two videos we're going to show two more exhibits back to back um, the next the first one is um, exhibit 10 number 10 read by Melissa Chandler she is an asylee from Venezuela and runs the pro se clinic at new, the New Sanctuary Coalition in New York City. She reads the testimony of an eight-year-old girl from Honduras who is in detention with her six-year-old sister. The second video, and it'll be the final one we'll show today, is an excerpt uh, from exhibit number 13, read by Kathleen uh, Chafont. This testimony was written by a pediatrician who evaluated 38 of the youngest children held in the Texas descent, uh, Detention Center facilities. Exhibit 10.
declaration of MCL and LLO, my little sister, IMZL, declare under penalty of perjury that the following is true and correct to the best of my knowledge and recollection. My little sister and I came from Honduras. She is six years old and I am eight years old. Our grandmother brought us to the United States so that we can live with our mother because it is not safe for us to stay in Honduras. Our mother lives in Houston. Our grandmother put our mother's telephone number in my jacket so that we can call her. But we have only spoken to her once in three weeks. One time my sister asked an official if we could please call her mom. The official said we had to wait. We talked to her one week after we got in a truck with border officials. Our stepdad's telephone number is they took us away from our grandmother and now we are all alone. They have not given us to our mother. We have been here for a long time. I have to take care of my little sister. She is very sad because she misses our mother and grandmother very much. My sister has been very sick. The doctor told her not to cry because if she cries, she will get sicker. One of the children in our cell is mean to us and tell us that we can't play and that we would be locked in a dark room here. I believe her and don't want to be locked in the dark room. We sleep on a cement bench. There are two mats in the room, but the big kids sleep on the mats, so we have to sleep on the cement bench. We have, to, we have been sleeping on the cement bench ever since we came here except when my sister got sick. She was quarantined and she got to sleep on a mat on the floor in another room. We have only been allowed to go outside four times. I have been only allowed to bathe twice since we came here. My sister has only been allowed to bathe once. The water is very cold. Some kids don't mind the cold water, but I wish it is warm. We have only been allowed to brush our teeth twice here. There is no soap except when you take a bath. We have been wearing the same clothes the entire time we have been here and no one has washed them. My sister and I hold a blanket up for one another so no one can see us when we go to the bathroom. I M Z L swear under penalty of perjury that the above declaration is true and complete to the best of my abilities. This declaration was read to me in Spanish, a language in which I'm fluent. Certificate of translation. I, Catherine Hagen, certify that I'm fluent in English and Spanish and that I read the above declaration of to MZL in Spanish. Katherine Hagen, June 18, 2019. Exhibit 13. I, Dolly Lucio Sevier, MD, declare as follows. This declaration is based on my personal knowledge and medical reference, except as to those matters based on belief, which I believe to be true. If called to testify in this case, I would testify competently about these facts. My name is Dolly Lucio Sevier. I am a board certified pediatrician licensed to practice medicine by the Texas Medical Board. I have been practicing as a general pediatrician in Brownsville, Texas since 2014 in the private practice Brownsville Kitty Health Center. 
I see both immigrant children and U.S. citizen children in my practice. I graduated from UT Southwestern Medical School in 2011 and completed my residency at Children's Medical Center, a large tertiary care center and referral hospital for North Texas in Dallas, Texas. I was asked by the Flores Agreement Settlement Attorneys as an expert pediatrician last summer to tour the Office of Refugee Resettlement Facility, Casa Rio Grande. I have made myself available to local nonprofit organizations caring for newly released immigrant families from the CBP processing centers to assist them in answering urgent medical questions regarding infants and children in the area. I continue to be an active member of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Texas Pediatric Society and advocate for quality care for immigrant infants and children crossing our southern border. On June 15, 2019, I visited the Ursula Border Processing Center in McAllen, Texas. I visited with 39 detainees, all minors except one, and performed a medical exam on 21 infants and children. My findings and grave concerns are listed below. Ursula Border Processing Center. The 39 detainees that I interviewed had a time in custody ranging between four and 24 days, far longer than the 72 hours outlined in the Flores Settlement Agreement. The American Academy of Pediatrics policy statement on the detention of immigrant, immigrant children is quite clear that it is never in the best interest for a child to be held in detention. Many of the detainees were teen mothers, already having been exposed to tremendous trauma in their home countries, on the journey north, and most certainly now in the conditions in which they are being held in custody of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Processing Facility. The conditions within which they are held could be compared to torture facilities. That is, extreme cold temperatures, lights on 24 hours a day, no adequate access to medical care, basic sanitation, water, or adequate food. All 39 detainees had no access to hand washing during their entire time in custody, including no hand washing available after bathroom use. Adequate hand hygiene is a basic sanitary requirement for infection control, especially in crowded places. The WHO considers hand hygiene the most important measure to avoid the transmission of harmful germs. In developing countries, it has been shown that implementing basic hand hygiene reduces infant mortality from respiratory and diarrheal illnesses by 50%. As such, it can be assumed that denying detainees access to this basic sanitary measure only serves to significantly increase the risk of infection. As a processing center that is struggling with infectious outbreaks, supplying soap and water or hand sanitizer could significantly reduce the medical costs associated with illness in the facility. It is in the collective conscious that everyone must wash their hands after bathroom use. To deny or not supply this basic necessity is tantamount to intentionally causing the spread of disease. I question whether there are appropriate infection control measures in any of the CBP processing centers and thus question whether this is an appropriate space to be holding any infants and children. Okay, we'd like to welcome back the panel. Um, and, uh, you know, the Flores exhibits, what I think I'd like us to consider is that the Flores exhibits is a virtual performance. Um, and it is making very visible and accessible these leaked testimonies that really damn our government for these horrendous abuses to children, um, breaking its own legal obligations with the Flores exhibit, but also bringing our attention to um, the, the humiliating conditions 
and life-threatening conditions that, that adults are exposed to as well. Um, and I want us to consider, take a few questions to consider, um, you know, what it means to do this as a, as a virtual video performance or other kinds of cultural production. So how have arti other artists, authors, culture makers raised awareness about state instituted violence at the border through the arts, literature, or other forms of expression? So I'll take a crack at that question. Um, I wanted to also acknowledge though that this morning as we all woke up, we were greeted with the news that 545 migrant children are still, uh, the lawyers are unable to locate their parents. And so that this is an ongoing crisis right now. I wanna talk about Valeria Luiselli's Tell Me How It Ends as the uh, artwork that comes the closest to doing the work that uh, the Flores exhibit does. And Valeria Luiselli, as she was waiting for her own green card, she is a Mexican novelist and who is a professor in the United States. She was waiting for her own green card. And so she worked as a translator during the time uh, in the Obama administration where um, there was a huge crisis in unaccompanied minors who were being taken into uh, custody. And she did translations of the type with the questionnaire that we have heard the exhibits uh, this, this afternoon. And so her collection, Tell Me How It Ends, is nonfiction and it contains excerpts from interviews she conducted with children along the same lines and, and following the same format with the same sign off uh, attesting to what the, the veracity of what they have given custody. One of the interesting contrasts though in that account versus some of the conditions that we heard about in the excerpts from the exhibits that were played today is that the, the lack of soap, the stench and the degradation that the children right now are experiencing was not an item that was mentioned. It, it was unremarked upon. So one can assume that at least they were getting access to proper hygiene during that time. Not that any of the other conditions were any better. She has then fictionalized that experience and uh, produced a best-selling novel, her first in English, called The Lost Children Archive, which was long listed for the Booker Prize in 2019. So either of these texts are real good points of entry for people who are finding uh, themselves very moved by these accounts and want to have access to real voices from children. Tell me how it ends, and then the Lost Children Archive has the same material, but fictionalized into the larger context of a meditation of what it means to have this system be part of our country. But as Dr. Guzman mentioned, it's not just um, migrants from uh, Mexico who are impacted. This type of um, mistreatment has befallen people who are Haitian immigrants, and Edward Stantegat has written about this incredibly movingly also in her um, memoir, Brother, I'm Dying, and her own uncle's death as part of a detention situation. And then there are also visual artists and sculptors uh, that are um, rallying around the hashtags, no kids in cages. There's guerrilla art performances and, and installations of literal cages with the hashtag, and then um, sculptors of children. I want to also acknowledge Raices, which is the Refugee and Immigration Center for Education and Legal Services. They also have are behind um, similar installations. And there's also, of course, a lot of um, slacktivism, you know, so, so uses of the hashtag to promote art that raises consciousness. But I do want to say that art echoes, amplifies, and, and for some people, maybe a, a more accessible first point of contact to hear these voices. And then I encourage anybody who's read or has um, seen installations such as the ones I've mentioned to look for the, the Flores exhibits to, to then hear unmediated accounts and performances of that. And then to see the toll I think one of the remarkable things we've seen this afternoon is the physical toll it takes on the performers' bodies as they read these words and are unable to help. So I just kind of wanted to acknowledge that, that, that it, in doing the performances that takes uh, its own kind of price on the performers. Yeah, 
Yeah, thanks for for highlighting all these other uh, works and 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 you know, uh, Professor Halloran for the you know the the bring our attention to the importance of art making in this. And I I mean yeah that seeing Melissa Chandler at the end of the testimony just kind of exhale, mm -hmm. um, you know that's really um, a marked moment. And um, I think that it kind of speaks to the um, the way this performance has been created to kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, let us know about the presence of the person reading and what they're going through as we're, you know, witnessing it too and, lis and listening to the testimony. Um, and I really find it interesting the way that they've included, um, you know, the translator's certification mm -hmm. and they're reading the I swear this, you know, you know, before, you know, sort of legal conventions before. So it's, there's all these, um, you know, voices mediating the children's voices at the other side of the, the young adults voices at the other side of, you know, these many layers. Um, and, and I think it's important that they've, you know, included that as, as a part of it, because as you said, you know, you feel this, uh, you know, through the reader, just that distance um, from the person suffering and, and um, at the hands of, of our government. Um, Let me add, uh, one of the more remarkable things about Edwidge Danticat is that she does not limit her artwork to adults. She actually has mm -hmm. picture books aimed directly at children, including Mama's Nightingale, in which a child narrator talks about her mother being detained because she is undocumented and her American citizen father takes care of her while she waits for the results of the, of the judgment uh, in terms of whether or not she'll be granted refugee status. So including children in this conversation mm -hmm. is possible and there are resources available. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, yeah, so, so uh, well, I'd, I'd like to think about to this, uh, the, the dilemmas too that might be that the performance draws our attention to in this way, you know, regarding, um, uh, uh, you know, this leaked testimony and how it's, um, you know, how the performance itself kind of resituates the the children's words or the young adults' words for advocacy and policy change. So, so I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. Uh, so among certain colleagues in anthropology that are doing this type of work, and I'm thinking specifically Dr. Gilberto Rosas, he is over at uh, Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He was actually at IU, um, I guess, of Latino studies maybe like five years ago when he was starting, he was working on his uh, book manuscript, which is supposed to be out soon, I hope. Um, and he, he does um, uh, advocacy work and he does also expert testimony. And he was really talking uh, about the challenges of this type of work of, and how he phrased it that it stuck with me and I, and you know, still very much present is, is the phrase, the idea of have to make dead in order to let live. Um, so he was talking about how in the moment when we're doing expert testimony or even in these cases that, you know, the Flores uh, exhibit or the cases that Dr. Halloran was just talking about. So there is this moment of creating vulnerability of really showcasing of making dead, right? Um, in order to be able to let live, save these individuals, these human beings, to make them, allowing them to be able to, to have a different future. Um, because to some degree, it becomes this idea of allowing, right? Allowing them to get into the country, to have documentations, all these different things, right? All the legal ramifications of it. So, so I remember in, with the conversation with, with Dr. Rosas, uh, it was this tension of having to do this but you needed to play with the stereotypes to some degree, all these negative stereotypes associated already with Latinos, with Me Mexicanos, Central Americans, and other refugees, right? Um, so that you're presenting, for example, uh, Mexico as this land, and it's, I keep saying Mexico just because that is my context, uh, but it applies to others, right? It is land of, of barbarism and violence and chaos and all these different things, right? Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, so I think my first expert affidavit, I was very conflicted about presenting, you know, making this way that not that I was lying or anything. It was, you know, it was presenting it raw, like just raw. And, um, 
and it was it was very conflicted afterwards i'm like nope this is what needs to be done right in order to be able to make these cases um, so I think the work that the florists exhibit, as well as other work, is very much just trying to present this rawness. But then it's this tension of how much then it falls into these stereotypes, or what other, for example, anthropologists and other scholars have been talking about, kind of like refugee pornography, immigration pornography, and these tensions, right? Also thinking about the work of Jason de Leon. Uh, and how he was talking in uh, the land of open graves and how he was talking about also in terms of how to present these deaths, these objects of, you know, during the immigration process and the crossing the border. Um, but so, so there is obviously this tension and we as academic, we can talk about obviously these tensions and theorize about it and all the fun things that we, we tend to do. But at the end of the day, it's how we can use this definitely for advocacy, for policy change. Um, so that, that um, so I think, again, it's really important to have these conversations, but at the same time, it's, it's in favor of what? Um, and how can we turn this specifically in favor of members of our, that are vulnerable in our you know, population? Um, I think that came out opposite, <laughs> but uh, so, but that are members, vulnerable members of our population. There we go. Um, so, so I think it's, yeah, so it's, it's how, you know, to resolve this tension. I, I don't think there's an easy answer, but this is why we need works, I think, like the Flores exhibit and as well as the ones that Dr. Halloran was talking about, right, to make it accessible to people uh, and especially to make people see, right, to actually see it. So, yeah. Eric, I just wanted to add on that point on what uh, my colleagues have mentioned uh, before, more on the pop culture and more like the, the use of a stardom but also telling personal stories. I was thinking on Diane Guerrero's In the Country We Love, My Family Divided, mm -hmm. how she's like sort of like a memoir of her own family. You know, she big star from Orange is the New Black and uh, Jane the Virgin. So like, so like being responsible on telling her story. And so like in the way in which other people can listen to that. And of course, J. Law, which in the uh, Super Bowl, is something that perhaps we can look at the, the, the critical part, but I want to highlight the, mm -hmm. the subversive nature and, and, and successful in, in a way, I mean, in many ways, uh, something that, that it, it was important to say and from a different locus of enunciation, perhaps not like Luc Luceli and, and the and the Florida exhibit, but also is there. I mean, is there, and we mm -hmm. need to look at all those little things mm -hmm. that are important because uh, like, for example, in the case of, of the LGBTQ asylum seekers, they're adding things like, for example, they want them to be so like to show proof to be very visible in the in their countries of origin when they can be killed. I mean, if they're from yeah. uh, some countries, I mean, and how do you prove that when they have suffered? But then you mm -hmm. add these new, I mean, there are some scholars trying to and, and lawyers trying to get rid of certain new categories that they are adding on the D zero policy things that it makes it more difficult. So I just wanted to add yeah. those couple of things. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for um, these thoughts. Um, I just want to move to the last question. But before I do, I did want to remind uh, people watching on Facebook Live that we will be taking your questions. So if you want to put questions into the chat um, for Facebook or submit it through Facebook Live feed, uh, that we'll, we'll be able to get your questions that way. Um, well, I think, you know, in, in thinking of, uh, you know, the the this, the, the stereotypes that come to mind with the, the, the way this, the, the, the testimony kind of, um, you know, uh, 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 points up certain things in order to make a case, you know, for Florida's uh, agreement violation specifically. Um, I also think of the, 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 you know, in this context we're living in right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, how, you know, Things like lack of hygiene, lack of soap, um, you know, that these, uh, you know, it, it, it helps. We are, we're, we're well aware of how this can be life threatening um, now, you know, although it always has been. Um, but the spreading of disease in, in this context, um, it just seems like one of the many forms of abuse and torture uh, wielded to deter immigration. Um, and so how does making this violence visible 
through this, through this, through the arts or through performance, video performances, how does that challenge the normalization of this? You know, it's something that we hear about, but we're not directly affected by. Um, I mean, just maybe for some come to accept. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll take that question. I, my internet was saying it was a little unstable, so you were breaking up a little bit. So hopefully I don't break up while I'm saying this, but um, so, you know, given the, the questions reference to visibility and, and the discussions that the comments that my colleagues have made, um, I want to maybe take a little different take on it or see the other side of the question of visibility. But I'd like to begin by focusing on the, the testimony of Elora uh, Mukherjee, mm -hmm. video 63, with which we began. Um, so while her testimony does certainly emphasize what she saw, um, it also brings other senses into consideration. And I would like to briefly reflect on um, the impact that this might have. Um, in her case, she underscores the presence of overwhelming smell. Um, what I find interesting here is the way in which she tends to decenter or at least supplement um, the function of the visual in the act of witnessing. Um, so while the regime of the visual is also um, characteristic of the structure of surveillance that defines the tension uh, and can certainly um, you know, imply a certain distance between, um, say, the observer and the observed. Uh, Mukherjee gives us a more embodied account of her experience, which despite the layers of mediation structured by legal conventions and the performance itself, um, can bring us closer to the experience of the relationship uh, between herself and the children she interviewed. Though here we can also note a degree of ambiguity in her response, um, since she's also put off by the smell, uh, but must endure and traverse the distance um, that the smell threatens to create between them, right? There's this moment where she says she usually likes to sit next to them, but she was also kind of like hesitating, right? But in a sense, it's a kind of political act to, to traverse that as well. So she reduces the gap um, that the visual regime of surveillance tries to maintain between guards and, and detainees, um, despite the fact that the guards are immersed in the daily life of incarceration. So the guards are in the middle of this, but perhaps are distant at the same time. And that distance is produced by the structure and architecture of surveillance. Um, and we can know that Mukherjee um, also describes holding and comforting a child and crying. And I think that this decentering of the visual uh, might be able to elicit a kind of reaction from viewers that is not so easily co-opted by the state. Um, and I think this is important um, because while making the invisible visible is uh, crucial, especially given the long history of secrecy and the limiting, limiting of public scrutiny that has characterized the immigration system in the US, um, we need to be realistic about the way visible violence can quickly be renormalized. Um, we can see something similar with COVID death rates, for example, which uh, don't elicit nearly the concern or outrage they did at the beginning of the pandemic, or when the estimate of 200,000 deaths was still only a possibility, right? So thus the reality paradoxically uh, is treated with less alarm than, than the possibility. Um, so visibility must be used tactically, um, but can't be seen as an end in itself, I don't think. Um, and we must also keep in mind that this visibility, while fundamentally important in the context of legal challenges to the detention of minors within the le U.S. legal system, is also consistent with the general framework of prevention through deterrence that I mentioned earlier. Um, the horrible and degrading conditions to which children and other immigrants and refugees are subjected, like I said, um, are not coincidental. They're not an accident. They're meant to deter others from coming. Um, thus, making these conditions visible can also inadvertently further this enforcement strategy by showing the would-be asylum seekers the kind of terrible conditions that await them. Um, so my point, and I want to be clear on this, is not to claim that making violence and suffering visible is politically or legally ineffective, but rather that we must also be aware of the range of consequences that may obtain from this. Um, and the possibility that some of these consequences may be contradictory, right? Yet, I think it's also important to know that the state's own strategies are subject to contradictions. So I would thus like to additionally suggest how the prevention to deterrence strategy fails, also paradoxically, but focusing more on its original site of implementation. So this strategy, um, as first formulated, is based on both the presence of the threat of death 
and the disappearance of bodies. Uh, it is the threat that one might disappear and die in the desert that is supposed to deter more people from crossing the border without authorization. Um, the making visible of human and other remains by activists, scholars, or cultural workers, and the stories that circulate about deaths in the desert uh, bring back a degree of appearance to the disappeared and can be used to raise awareness of the inhumanity of border enforcement. Yet it also feeds into the Border Patrol's effort to make the threat of death more real. Um, but in a context where the threat of premature death has become visible and normalized, and when it has become part of the, say, the quotidian fabric of individual and social experience in the places from where uh, immigrants and refugees come, the whole premise of the strategy of prevention, prevention through deterrence is actually undermined. So rather than decide not to cross the border because of the threat of death, it is precisely because of the threat of death that they must cross the border, right? Similarly, we might say that while the degrading conditions and trauma experienced in the det detention centers are meant to deter more people from coming, um, it is the existence and normalization of similar conditions in their home countries that force them to go toward and try to endure the conditions in the hope of finding some relief at the end of the process. So prevention through deterrence actually assumes a world where violence and the threat of death are not normalized, right? In forming part of a strategy that precisely normalizes these conditions, it undermines its own reason for being. Yeah, and I would agree with that and point to the, the testimony from the pediatrician who was citing the World Health Organization's uh, standards for basic care to, for the maintenance of life. And Dr. De Los Reyes' reference to the detainees who are not, or refugees who are not being given access to their medication for HIV, diabetes, likewise. So what this administration's policy has done is explicitly weaponizing other bodies. So the, the conditions of overcrowding, lack of um, the necessities to maintain life, like medicine and the basic hygiene and sufficient food and heat, uh, and letting those, uh, those factors work against the bodies of the refugees and the people who are detained to result in death or deterioration without themselves doing anything proactive to cause that. So withholding is its own kind of threat. And then it allows, in essence, people's close proximity to one another um, to kill them. And it's ironically the same policy of uh, not wearing masks that it's mm -hmm. uh, being proposed to, its, to mm -hmm. Americans at large, right? Don't do the things that science tells us will keep our bodies healthy. So it's, it's just across the board. And to add into the conversation in terms of the bodies and the monitoring of the bodies, I mean, what we heard also a couple of, what was it, a couple of months ago about the, the hysterectomies happening, right, and the mass sterilization in the detention center in Georgia. Um, so in terms of this way of, uh, you know, violating, controlling the bodies, and also a very much um, torture, uh, because in terms of this history, right, of these women being sterilized and then be being sent back across the border, uh, sterilized. So and with no, nothing, no, no choices, right? So in terms of, and uh, it became normalized in terms of there was a little bit of protest and then people, it was like, well, that is happening. Let's continue to the next horrible thing that is happening this week. Um, so, so this process of almost a desintetizar um, um, or desensibilizar, how do you say that in English right now? Uh, desensibilize? Desensitize. Desensitize, thank you. <laughs> uh, and um, so in terms of uh, that, that uh, you know, I think going also with what Dr. Guzman was saying, right, that, that for some people it's become normalized by how, how to subvert it. Um, and then going in with the, this control of the bodies that is happening and, and as a way also controlling of the bodies in very violent and, and torture kind of like ways. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I think, um, this, uh, on this point, the, the idea that also the, the, so like the asylum seeker or the detainee or this person, they, they become uh, disposable subjects, right? And, and sometimes it's sort of like something that happens and then it's normalized. And I mean, we need to sort of like be careful with, with that risk, I guess, more like uh, the, I mean, a strategic visibility i think is something that is important to think about and you know because also we have that discussion during uh, when 
when the when the Flores agreements that the Trump administration was saying like yes we we are keeping them safe and and giving them a tooth a toothbrush for example is not a basic requirement to keep someone safe so then those debates come to the forge and then become legal debates that that are just you know how is the U, the U.S. legal system that that whoever pays more money and whoever has the most convincing uh, argument will will gain, will will win the case so. I think um, it is important the, the visibility, but I think and, and I and I think the Flores exhibits uh, do a good job, and because sometimes also some people would say you know ojos que no ven corazón conociente right if you don't know, I mean, you don't know I mean and you won't suffer, but I guess a strategic visibility, and and so like uh, being, uh, and using advocacy the right ways, it is important for bring so like uh, more attention and responsible uh, application of, of what is necessary to these cases. So thank you everyone for contributing to the this discussion and I think it's going to have to be ongoing. Um, I do have one question from uh, the Facebook audience which is towards uh, Dr. De Los Reyes and Martinez Rivera. Um, about um, it, it being folklorists and involved in this, um, in, you know, with, with your advocacy. Um, and it's a question about the professional uh, folklore society or really to any professional academic society organizations, um, how can the professional society help or lend expertise to these issues? <laughs> you're muted just in case Guillermo uh, yeah. yeah but yeah but if you if you want so with the American Folklore Society that we had our meeting actually last week I did mention right in terms of uh, we were in this panel and I mentioned that that is actually one of the things that we as folklorists could be doing uh, so in terms of action and bringing positive change um, into into the world right as some of our colleagues they do a research among what are you know different parts of the world that are vulnerable populations and that are actually also uh, asking for refugee uh, or refuge not only in the United in the United States but in other places. I know that in anthropology actually there is um, more colleagues um, as I mentioned that I've been doing this for a while. So as I mentioned, you know, Dr. Gilberto Rosas over at uh, UIC, uh, no UI. Um, Illinois Urbana Champaign. Uh, there's another colleague uh, who has also kind of like served as a mentor as I started in this in this process and they were mentoring me. So it's uh, Dr. Beatriz este, de los Reyes Foster. She is in Central Florida. Um, so so in, in anthropology and actually in the society, the American Anthropological Society, they do have panels on expert witness testimony and what that entails and, and how to help people actually do that type of work. So I know that in anthropology, again, and the American Anthropological Society is creates that space as part of this as part of the annual meetings and folklore that is in our to-do list on top of a lot of different other things that we need to do but again still right as um societies as well as universities right that have this type of work i mean Guillermo, i think you were talking about that you were contacted by a center at your university right and that's how you started right that, so that there's some universities that they do or are affiliated with different organizations that provide support to refugees and immigration legal advice in general so that they partner up with different departments to be able to provide these services so there's different ways of doing this right the, the funny part is that my university knew about me through lambda legal so i went to a conference talking about you know learned societies and mm -hmm. um like the american folklore society i went to new york at a conference on lgbtq issues and and, and then i was talking about mexico and my work with with Mexican migrants here in Houston, and, and uh, through that organization, they so sort of like the, the immigration clinic at the University of Houston contacted them for experts, and they said you have one at your university. That is why it's very important. What can an, an organization such as, such as AFS can do? So like try to give resources, for example, name, name names of, of people in the society. So like do a, a I mean a survey on who are expert witness. 
who can do country conditions for different parts of the world. And I think so like they, what the universities do that, for example, when uh, ABC or CBS would like to interview, like for example, last week I was interviewed about, about La Llorona and the Chupacabras, you know, because they wanted to do something related to, to the end of this month and the days of the day, they, 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 they went there and they contacted me. The same learning societies can do it, the American Anthropological Association, the American Sociological Association, the American Political Science Association, etc. So that's a way that they can do it because I didn't know I could be the next expert witness, and I've been doing it since 2012. And learning a lot and doing work that matters, as Gloria and Saldua says. So we also want to have some, um, uh, you know, as part of the Flores exhibit, Waterwell has put together some action steps that everybody watching can take part in. Um, but first, I just want to thank the panelists one more time. Thank you, Professor Guzman, uh, Professor De Los Reyes, Professor Halloran, Professor Martinez Rivera. Um, your comments and your, your careful thought has made this such a, an amazing event. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and as we continue to think about it, I also want to thank Madison Colquette, um, the Department of Theater, Drama, and Contemporary Dance, and the Arts and Humanities Council at Indian University Bloomington for um, sponsoring this event and for uh, Madison for organizing the event. Um, and thank you to um, uh, Lee Sunday Evans as well for joining us here today and, um, and creating this important work along with her colleagues at Waterwell. You know, one thing is to, is to spread the word. This, the Flores Exhibit um, website uh, is, is public. It can be shared, share a story with, um, with people in your network. Um, also, um, you know, get locally connected. Um, there's the Central Comunal um, in, here in Bloomington. Um, you know, get involved, volunteer, donate, um, and also be aware of, you know, uh, undocumented immigrants, um, asylum seekers who are held in detention in our area at Clay County Dis Detention Center. Um, and then the third action step is uh, to uh, deepen your knowledge and get to know um, a little bit more about the Flotus Agreement and how we can advocate to make this um, more than just a legal settlement that the, that the um, federal government is obliged to, but you know, in thinking in terms of immigration law reform. Um, and so um, we're sending in Facebook um, a link for this document so people can access it too and download it and think about that um, and, and, and take action and get involved. Uh, all right, I think that concludes our event. So thank you again, everyone for joining us. <laughs>